with all that stuff in mind, the circumstances surrounding the King James Version and how it got started, how was it done? Like today, when a Bible translation is done, there's usually a committee, they all come around the table, they throw their ideas back and forth and try some translations out and, and all that kind of stuff. What, what did the King James Version translators do? Yeah, good, good question. Um, and it was a complicated process. And there is some debate about how much of the originally envisioned process ultimately took place. In that meeting at Hampton Court, when the King James was first proposed, King James threw out a kind of a list of things that he wanted to take place and how the version would be created. And it would be done by a group of translators who would double check it. And then it would be ratified by parliament and approved by his seal of authority. Well, and well, some of that very clearly didn't happen. So did, did you say ratified by parliament? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. That was one of the wow. original plans. Um, according to William Barlow's account of the Hampton Court Conference, James had originally planned that Parliament would ratify. I, actually, I say Parliament, the Privy Council, his Privy Council would ratify the specific work that was done, and he would ratify it. As far as we know, that never took place. Right, but as the right. work kind of got underway in 1604, King James sat down with Richard Bancroft, who was the Bishop of London, and during this process became the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is the highest office that someone can hold in the Church of England. It's like right. the King is in charge of everything and just under the king is the archbishop of canterbury he's over both provinces and all the individual bishops that run their churches gotcha, so richard gotcha. bancroft is appointed to lead the creation of the king james bible and james and bancroft get together and they put together a list of 14 rules that would guide the translators and then they add a 15th in the middle of their process uh, when they realize some clarity was needed and they basically set up the way i break it down different scholars break it down different ways the way i would set it up they basically set up a three-stage process that would create the king james bible and we need to understand that first First, the King James Bible was, and we'll talk about this later when we talk about the myths, it's a revision, actually, not a new translation. So it's a revision of the Bishop's Bible. And how's this revision going to be made? Well, it's going to be made in three stages. In the first stage, what I call the company stage, the groups of translators, there's, uh, I say about 50, we don't know the exact number. 54 are mentioned in a letter by King James early on, but the list that we have of translators only named 47. So there's always been right. some debate about exactly how many, and we have some others named elsewhere that we don't know exactly where they work. So the safest thing is just to say, about 50. So we've got about 50 translators and the King and Bancroft divide them into six groups at three locations, Westminster, right. Cambridge, and Oxford. And at each location, you've got two teams. You've got a team of Greek specialists and a team of Hebrew specialists. And then they kind of parcel the Bible out, the Old Testament, New Testament, and the Apocrypha to those teams. And then those teams would get together every week for the course of several years and uh, work on their selected portion of the text. So they're not working on the whole Bible yet. They're just working on their selected portion. And according to the rules, what was supposed to happen, individual translators were supposed to come up with their own personal translation or revision, proposed revision to the Bishop's Bible and bring it to the meetings. And then in the company meetings, they would discuss between themselves, which of those were best, what should be changed, what should be added. And when that process was done, each company would send its proposed revision visions to the stage two. And stage two took place at Stationers Hall in London in, right. in uh, 1610. For nine months in London, instead of all the translators, just 12 men, two from each of the companies, sit down and go over the whole Bible and make veto decisions, hmm. basically, about what has been proposed right. by the other right. advisors. Right. Um, and they they kind of have more of the final say. And then in what I would call the third stage, you have a few final revisers, um, Miles Smith, Thomas Bilson, that put finishing touches on the text. So we don't know exactly how many changes they made. Some some people suggest that all they did was add the prefatory material and the paratextual material. Some suggest that they also made some changes to the text. There's been some debate about that, but I, I would still call that a third stage that we could call finishing touches. So it's created right, in right. those basic three stages, and that's how it's birthed as a revision of the bishop. That's really intense. That That's like a lot of stuff all in yeah, one yeah, go. Yeah, it's a huge process. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. Took, when, when did the translation start? When did the translation work start? So we're not exactly certain, but it seems to have been in swing. Uh, uh, at least by 1605. It may have been in swing much earlier. I mean, the Hampton Court Conference takes place in January 1604. Right. Um, and there's some indication that maybe by late 1604, it was started. But one of the things that we really want to keep in mind, we have six different companies in six different places. Yeah. So they probably don't all move at the same pace and they, right. they don't necessarily yeah. start at the same time. There's a lot of differences between how the companies handle things. Um, so it, it'd be hard to pin down unless you looked at each individual company and said, right. when did this company start and finish? When did this company start and finish? So there's there's a little bit of a organic feel to it. I think. Right. It's not, it's not like they had collaboration software and they were able to right. like link up yeah. through their KJV networks, you know? <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> we need to keep that in mind because we yeah. tend to think today in our society, we're so connected by cell phones, email, text messages. In that day and time, that kind of close connection wasn't possible. 
And because they're at three different locations, obviously you can send letters to each other uh, via messenger, but because they're at three different locations, meeting separately in little yeah. groups of three or four, maybe 10 at the most, there's not a whole lot of collaboration going on yet. That comes during the general meeting. Yeah, communication took some serious time. So essentially it took somewhere between six and seven years for the translation to be completed. I, yeah. I don't know where that sits uh, in regards to modern English translations. That yeah. seems like, I think the New King James Version was done in seven years. I don't know about the others, but... I don't want to say that's par for the course, but I went, especially when you consider the communication sure. uh, challenges yeah, I mean, that so we would have had. I would say it's definitely distinct for its time. The mm -hmm. Bishop's Bible took a very, very long time to create, but there's a lot of debate about how many people actually ended up working on it. There was a plan kind of like the King James to have a big committee work on it, but most people think that that didn't happen and it ended up being the work of really just a handful of individuals, maybe a dozen. So the King James was really the first English translation that was making use of this massive committee of scholars that are all working together. And even beyond just those scholars, they at various points consulted people that weren't some of the original translators that I would just call consultants. So they're involving dozens and dozens, maybe scores of people in this translation. That, that was really the first time that was done. If you think back to like the earliest English translations, William Tyndale creates his English translation of the New Testament in 1526. He's working right. mostly by himself. He'll right, get input right. from some others, but basically it's a one man translation. Today, we just kind of take for granted mm -hmm. that you're going to have these big translation committees like the right. For, right. the, for Bible translation for the NIV that gets together. But really, in a lot of ways, the King James innovated that idea of just involving lots and lots of scholars, as many as possible, lots of process of checks and balances and reviews. And it's one of the things that gave it its beauty and its ability right. to appeal to such a wide range of uh, readers and audiences. So then when, when the translation was completed and it was run on the printers and, and copies started getting distributed, how was it initially received? So there's been a couple different takes on that. David Norton wrote years ago, he started writing on the history of the Bible as literature and then wrote a whole book nice. condensed from that on the history of the English Bible as literature. And his basic thesis was that the King James Bible was poor literature. It was bad English and nobody oh. really loved it until the middle of the 17th century. That wow. was kind of the thesis that he advanced. Most people have bought that today, and I think there's some truth to it. I do think Norton is right really? that, yeah, I mean, so we, we tend to think today of this great English literary style, the majestic English of the yeah. King James Bible. Yeah, because you're blowing day, my mind right now. Oh, really? I was, yeah, yeah, I always well, thought it Norton's was like, work. yeah. Pick up Norton's work. He, he develops, that's basically the thesis of this entire book is to develop that claim and, and to ask the question, how did the King James Bible go from a translation that wasn't high highly thought of to today, where we call it in the phrase of one article title, the noblest monument of English prose. How, how did that happen? Right. So right. I, I think Norton's, I agree with Norton in that I don't think it was seen as beautiful, elegant literature at the time, but I actually disagree with Norton about how quickly it was liked and used. He suggests that basically the King James wasn't liked by anybody at first, and that the only reason it became the quote unquote standard Bible is because of some of the political debates that were taking place between it and the Geneva and then Archbishop. William Laud, 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 I don't know how, how to pronounce his name, L-A-U-D, suppressed yeah. the Geneva Bible and made the King James the only one that could be, be printed. So he kind of says it happened kind of from above, power from above, forcing the King James Bible on right. the people that don't want it. I actually disagree. And I think there's been some recent work done in uh, the last few years that would disprove parts of his thesis. Reese and Wakely, Graham, Re Graham Weiss and Maria Wakely, just a few years ago discovered, I don't know if they were the ones that discovered it, but they've made use of the biggest collection of documents about the King's printing house under James that's ever been known before. They've discovered right. this huge, massive cache of documents. Oh, nice. uh, some of them have, that have never seen the light of day for hundreds of years. So they've dug through all that and published this wonderful work about printing under the era of King James and the publisher's house. And one of the things that their work shows is that the King James Bible was printed and propagated widely very early on, pretty much right. as soon as it was published, people liked it. And it went through loads of new editions right away because people were using it. And if we look at sermons from the time, not everybody uses it. Not all the King James translators used it. Interestingly enough, uh, some of the translators like Lancelot Andrews, famous yep. preacher even to this day, usually doesn't quote the King James Bible, even though he works on it. He, he continues mostly to translate directly from the Vulgate. So the different translators probably hold different opinions. But by and large, I think the King James was pretty popular from right away as an English translation. I do think Norton's right that it probably wasn't seen as elegant literature until some time later in the 17th century, maybe the end of the 17th century. But I think it was popular right away and it sold well right away. It had some obvious merits. People loved it. And it just, I think it hit people where, where they were wanting. And again, it was trying to, to heal this political divide. And at least during James's lifetime, I think it worked. I, I think people right. from both sides of the spectrum ended up liking it.
that fact totally blows my mind is that it was thought initially as like poorly grammarized. It totally made that word up. That's probably poorly grammarized <laughs> no, too. That's fine. <laughs> but well, so I, let me give you an example too of, of yeah, kind sure. of where some people uh, point that. So if you read the preface to the King James, um, the yep. translators to the reader by yep. Miles Smith, you'll immediately notice anybody who's familiar with the King James, they'll immediately notice yeah. that the the language of the preface is way a different. much more elevated. Yeah, right. Like yeah. way different. It's a totally more elevated prose than the King James. Mm -hmm. And some people have suggested, uh, actually several people have suggested that part of that is because Miles Smith really didn't like the fact that the King James Bible was lower level English and he wanted it to be more exalted prose. So mm -hmm. in his opinion, part of the way he was writing might've been a snub at what he right, considered to be right. the bad English of the King James. So, but I'll some... mention one other author too. Uh, Robin Griffith Jones is a priest in the Anglican church. And he explains in a beautiful article, one of the best I've ever read on the subject. It's a chapter in this publication that was done by the SBL for the 400 year anniversary of the King James. Nice. He suggests that the reason the King James has kind of the literary register that it does isn't because that's the language that was being spoken at the time or necessarily the language that was being written at the time. And it's not because they were aiming at an elegant production. I think David Norton is right. They weren't trying to be elegant. The reason it has that literary structure that we're so familiar with today, the these and the thous <clears throat> and the, the sure. Latinisms is because it was essentially the, the language of liturgy. Like the English church, again, if mm. we step back and realize it's unique in all the other right, Protestant churches right. in that it's still got the Book of Common Prayer. This is uh, Brian Cummings, critical edition of the Book of Common Prayer. Highly recommended to anybody. I think it's the, the best text that's been done today. But they've got this liturgy where every time they come to a church service, and it's not like a once a week thing for them, they've got morning and evening prayer every day. And right. they've got designated scripture readings, designated prayers. So in the liturgy, in the church service, there's already this sort of language that's fossilized that right. everybody's used to in church as church language. And the King James Bible really was produced as a companion volume to the Book of Common Prayer. And so it ends up having that exact same language. And Robin Griffith Jones right, says that's really right. because it's stuck in the language of liturgy. And I really think that's why it has the and, English register that it does. And so essentially, it's a product of, of a church, which is half Catholic and half Protestant. I would be careful how we say that. I, yeah. You make a lot of people really upset if we call <laughs> okay, it half okay. Catholic. What it is, I think the best way to say it is the Church of England at the time was Protestant <clears throat> in its doctrine, <clears throat> but still Catholic in its ceremony. So it's got right, a Catholic right. ceremony, but utterly and totally reformed Protestant doctrine. Right. Very but interesting. But yeah, that, that ultimately is what shapes the language, in my opinion, shapes the language of the King James Bible. Well, thanks, Timothy, for sharing all that with me. Uh, we're going to finish this section of the video. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing this stuff about the King James Version. I mean, this stuff is totally blowing my mind.